um, welcome for those who are joining uh, uh, the conference for the first time. Um, many thanks again to everybody, and special thanks to the speakers for the day and for the morning session. Uh, the floor goes to Valeria Fertini, who has kindly accepted to chair the session this morning. Um, and I'm uh, just uh, I just would like to mention that Valeria is a member of the team which uh, applied for this Jean Monnet program, so she's uh, at the same time chair for the session, a very uh, a dear uh, lead uh, and uh, a um, member from the staff of the team which has been working on this project. Valeria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marco. And let me welcome the speakers of today and thank all the participants in this session on the session of this morning, which is devoted to the flows of migrant and fundamental human rights. So a very big issue, a very big topic for the um, As chair of this session, uh, I'd like to shortly uh, introduce uh, the, the, the session of this with some remarks about uh, uh, the link between uh, uh, migration flows and protection of migrant rights uh, in the global context. Also, in order to better uh, interview uh, the panelists of, uh, of this morning. Uh, so, just a few words. Uh, um, as everybody knows, the history of humanity is a history of migration. Nevertheless, uh, uh, in the last 30 years, at least in Europe, uh, we are dealing with, uh, I, I say, a new form of migration, a migration that is uh, characterized by some specific uh, profiles uh, on which uh, I think uh, um, a new attention should be drawn, both from states and from uh, European as well as international law which are very shortly uh, these uh, or some of these specific uh, profiles of new migration. Firstly, I think, uh, of course, the new migration can no longer be considered in emergency, uh, contingent, uh, unpredictable terms, because uh, the new migratory flows have, uh, everybody knows, of course, uh, have a structural, uh, a um, systemic, a, um, a character that is uh, not contingent uh, as in the past. Uh, migratory flows affect uh, today many states uh, at the same time all around the world. There is no longer a distinction between countries of immigration and countries of immigration. Uh, migration, uh, migrations have become circular mm -hmm. in a certain sense. Uh, not only migrations from poor countries or countries afflicted by wars and feminists uh, towards economically developed countries, because even between rich and democratic countries uh, of the West, uh, France, Spain, UK, Germany, Italy, migratory flows are constant and significant. The countries, for example, I mentioned, are both countries of immigration and countries of emigration. This is the first uh, um, element that uh, is important, I think, to uh, underline. Secondly, the new migration phenomenon is a complex one. Uh, the reasons that lead uh, to the choice to uh, migrate can be uh, numerous, both general as well as individual factors. For example, social, economic, uh, uh, environmental, climatic, uh, demographic factors, but also uh, age, uh, education, sex, language, and religion. As a, a speaker of today will uh, will show uh, us, also these personal individual factors can contribute to the choice, to the very personal choice to migrate. And thirdly, due to the fact that new migration flows are systemic and complex ones, the legal and political decisions should be uh, shared, I think, as much as possible at the global level. 
and which are the main approaches, both at national and international level, to these issues. Looking at the national level, uh, we observe, we can observe, that uh, despite the establishment of a common migration policy, according to the TFEU, the management of uh, migration flows is still in the hands of foreign states because each state uh, decides, uh, for example, in Europe, in the European Union, each state decides who can enter, on what conditions, uh, uh, what rights should be recognized to migrants, who deserves uh, full integration in the host society and possibly citizenship. In this dimension of the phenomenon, state sovereignty should <coughs> consider the protection of the right to uh, migrate and the protection of the fundamental rights of migrants. Nevertheless, uh, this goal is often uh, overshadowed by other priorities, uh, such as the need to guarantee the public security within the host society, within the territorial border of the host country. And looking at the international level, um, uh, we, we know that there are several documents, uh, for example, uh, documents adopted by the United Nations since uh, the Universal Declaration of 1948. Uh, many international documents uh, um, stipulate uh, the right to migrate, uh, migrant rights, uh, the right to seek uh, asylum, to have a citizenship. But uh, specific duties uh, for states in this sense uh, are not always provided. I, mm, I'd like uh, mm, main, to mention just uh, mm, some of these recent, uh, the most recent documents uh, adopted at the international level. For example, um, for example, uh, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, or uh, in 2016, the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants, um, two global compacts adopted uh, by the United Nations in 2018, the Global Compact for safe, orderly and regular migration and the Global Compact uh, on Refugees. Well, all these instruments reveal a partial and unsatisfactory approach. Um, for example, the Global Compacts, the two Global Compacts I, I just mentioned, are non-binding documents, are documents of soft law. Uh, the 2030 Agenda does not consider migrants um, uh, as vulnerable subjects, as vulnerable rights, whose dignity as persons uh, must be respected, first of all, but rather migrants are considered for the positive contribution they can offer to the economic growth and the development, sustainable or not, it doesn't matter, of the host countries. Uh, the 2016 New York Declaration, I mentioned, the New, the New York Declaration for uh, Refugees and Migrants, for example, actually seems uh, to take note of the systemic and complex nature of migration. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, also this uh, declaration makes uh, reference once more to the fact that migrants contribute or can contribute to economic growth and development of the whole society, to the benefits of regular and controlled migration. And finally, this declaration uh, takes uh, at the end a, a mention to the sovereign right of individual state to decide who admit or not on their territory. Uh, just a few words uh, uh, with regard to the position of international and supranational courts uh, over these issues. Uh, and two examples. Uh, we can observe uh, a general prudence uh, on these issues uh, uh, on the part of uh, international and supranational courts. Um, I, I make reference to the European Court of Strasbourg and to the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union. These courts uh, uh, refer to the margin of appreciation uh, to the sovereignty uh, of individual states uh, but also these courts, uh, so to speak, uh, um, show a step forward and a step backward in their case law. 
for example, some recent rulings uh, of the Court of Justice seem uh, actually to open uh, to a greater awareness and solidarity toward migrant rights in the name of principles of non-discrimination, reasonableness, proportionality, which are the principles normally used in the reasoning of the Court of Luxembourg. A recent judgment of last May, of May 2020, um, declared that the placing of asylum seekers and of third country nationals who are the subject of a return decision in a specific transit area, in a specific transit zone uh, at the Serbian-Hungarian border must be classified, according to the words of the Court of Justice, as a detention measure. And for that reason, um, that zone is incompatible, inconsistent with the EU law. As a consequence, uh, uh, the Hungarian uh, government has actually implemented that ruling and dissolved that zone. On the other part, uh, uh, a more prudent, uh, uh, a more prudent approach uh, is that of the European Court of Human Rights, of the Court of Strasbourg. Um, in a recent ruling of this uh, court, of the Grand Chamber of this court uh, against Spain, recent ruling of last February concerning the return of some migrants from Morocco to Spain, the court of Strasbourg appears, as uh, some uh, scholars uh, uh, wrote, more interesting in protecting states from people than vice versa. The court, the Grand Chamber, decided that the pushbacks of some people uh, at the European external border with Morocco was not uh, inconsistent with the European Convention on Human Rights. Why? Because the applicants could have made use of the legal possibilities to apply for asylum at the border instead of trying to overcome the border fortifications illegally. So the applicants were unlawful migrants uh, in the words, uh, in the reasoning of the Grand Chamber. And for that reason, they had no right to complain about the treatment received. That decision was um, hardly uh, criticized, was commented as a shocking judgment, as a slap to the protection of human rights of migrants, as a dangerous precedent, as a danger, a severe danger for the European project and for the credibility of the court itself as a guardian of the fundamental rights. In conclusion, reflecting on migration flows nowadays, uh, I think, uh, means uh, rethinking the essence of the states, of the host states, uh, and the ways in which uh, uh, each state uh, exercises its uh, sovereignty. Um, reflecting on migration on uh, migration flows today means updating the European migration policy, I think. Means uh, rewriting the legal status of migrants without neglecting their dignity as persons and the protection of their right to diversity. Uh, during this session, we listened to uh, a paper in this sense, uh, diversity in, in all dimensions, cultural, ethnic, linguistic, and religion diversity. Reflecting on migration flows means keeping in mind the link between rights, peace, democracy, rule of law, and duties of the states, of course. All these goals uh, take on an even more uh, urgent and in some ways tragic connotation in the face of the coronavirus emergency in recent months, which has made the issues of inequality and solidarity um, and hospitality uh, even more problematic. In this perspective, I think that uh, a resiliency approach uh, to these issues uh, now, more than in the past, a resiliency approach is not enough. Uh, in the next future, in the coming months, I think we know if the pandemic uh, has offered a good lesson hmm, for rethinking our fortress Europe or not. That is, among others, in this period, uh, a real challenge for our public institutions. 
Well, I took too much time for this presentation, but uh, I think that uh, speaking today of migration flows and, and uh, migrants' rights is uh, really a, a very uh, important issue. And during this Congress, during this conference, we have uh, actually an opportunity to analyze many of these issues from different points of view. The panel of today, of this morning, is devoted to the flows of migrants and fundamental human rights. Um, in a few seconds, I give the floor to the speakers of this morning. Um, I, I wish to remind uh, in the speakers that uh, the time uh, for each presentation is uh, 30, 30 minutes. Uh, we shall listen uh, to the first two presentations, then uh, there will be a break immediately after uh, two more presentations, and then a uh, final discussion. Um, before starting, just some general technical recommendations for everyone. I remind all the participants uh, that the session will be uh, recorded. Uh, I invite the speakers to uh, disable your microphones and webcams and to switch on them only when you talk. Uh, the speakers are invited to use the chat uh, to ask questions or report uh, technical issues, uh, taking into account, uh, taking into consideration that all the participating speakers, uh, all uh, the participants, uh, see what is uh, being written. Um, I suggest uh, to the participating speakers to pin the video uh, to the active speaker so, so that he or she will appear on the screen at all times. Uh, the public can ask questions to the speakers uh, by sending uh, an email to the organizer or by chat during the event or by an intervention at the end uh, when we will open the discussion. I ask the organizer, uh, Dr. Isabella Mazet, to, to correct me if I, if I said something wrong or incomplete, please. No? If not, if everything is if, if everything is okay, uh, we are ready to start. And uh, I give the floor first of all to Professor. Uh, oh, excuse me for non-Italian speakers. Excuse me for my bad pronunciation of your names. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Professor um, Lubica Saktorova. Vice Dean for International Relations and Development at the Faculty of Law of Matei Bell University in Banska Bistrica. The title of the presentation is Sequence of Events Called for the End of Migration Crisis. You have uh, the, the floor, please. Thank you very much, so much. And uh, not prophecy yet, <laughs> well, thank you. Also, I would like to thank Professor uh, Ventura and Professor Pavoni to, to have this great opportunity to participate in this project. And uh, I feel really honored to, to be among you and, and be a part of all this. Um, thank you. Uh, what I'm going to talk about um, is the symptoms of the migration crisis. And I will try to determine its potential treatment, both from the global and the European point of view. Um, finally, it will be asserted that not the national nor the global tools are currently able to provide the community satisfactory solutions. The security architecture with potential to heal this crisis should be built on the European pillars. Um, the latest European migration crisis challenged the European world leaders with an ambitious task. Um, and I can't see you now. <laughs> I'd like to see you. Um, which is tries to handle historically recurring sociological phenomenon that for the first time in the framework of the rights and obligations sets out in the European and international legislations. The European Union tackles um, the migration crisis with dignity in, in the context of all the other great challenges it currently faces and it lately faced, since it really is a demanded task to handle intervening the internal external security of state and its citizens, international relations, economy, social systems, the culture, basically all streams of uh, domestic policy on one hand, but on the other hand, also very fragile nature of human life 
and the full list of human rights concerns, uh, the measures must be taken comprehensively. Despite establishing various mechanisms to coordinate the migration during the past decades, uh, it was only in 1999 that the EU officially started to work towards a common migration policy. The current migration crisis highlighted the urgency to reform the existing EU asylum rules. However, these reforms are the answers for the current questions uh, and the plasters for very serious and different violence. Um, millions of people flow to seek safer, healthier environment for their future, causing the urgency for new structural changes in the way the European countries function. This has not been welcomed cheerfully by public. Uh, post 9-11 environment in particular has highlighted the salience of negative stereotypes of Arabs and Muslims in European public discourse by sometimes indiscriminately quoting uh, quoting the Middle East, Muslims, and terrorism. Um, 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 to such audiences, those arriving to Europe are not viewed as refugees in need of help, but uh, rather a liability to national security, social stability, or cultural identity. Soldiers in Hungarian urban's invading army. The rise of the far right wing populism in recent years, also in Slovakia, winning the crowd with anti migratory rhetoric, represents the best reflection of the true threats this crisis caused. Directly or indirectly, the irregular massive migration causes the threats to business security of people. What mechanism, institution, what tools or measures must be or must not be adopted to resolve the issues? I will try to argue. However, in order to identify the processes called for the end of the migration crisis, it is indispensable to name its causes. So in the first third of my presentation, I would like to talk about the causes of the migration, briefly, basically. The second third will be uh, devoted to some global tools, instruments that could help prevent the migration crisis. Uh, and the third, but will um, be devoted or will be focused on the European tools. So the first political upheaval, communal, ethnic measures, rise of religious extremism, and foremost, the rise of terrorist group uh, have meant the most countries in Middle East and North Africa, uh, North, known also as MENA countries, uh, and Africa are affected by internal and cross-border displacement although the magnitude varies dramatically. The common denominator for the first determinant of such massive displacement of people is violent conflict. The causes of conflict in Middle East have exceptionally long, deeply embedded religious roots. The escalation of tensions of the last decade has been fueled mostly by the political and economical reasons. Africa has been affected by cycles of conflict be it armed interventions, non-state conflicts, civil conflicts, witnessed an increasing number of conflicts during the 17th and 80s, resulting from the Cold War era, when the superpowers and their allies fought and supported a broad range of wars and minor conflicts. The second half of the 90s were more peaceful than the first one. The decade again witnessed a great violence in the region. Finally, since December 2010, MENA countries have experienced a wave of protests, uprising, demonstration, collectively referred to as the Arab Spring. The region is even historically very destabilized. The current zone of vivid violent conflicts could be located to well-known occupied Palestinian territories that shaped the life of Israelis as Palestinians since 8, uh, 1948. Yemen, representing the worst humanitarian crisis in modern history with six very, very violent years. And civil war in Syria, which started as a part of the Arab Spring, but um, shifted in, into an unexpected, still persisting catastrophe. Peacekeeping and peace building activities in post war countries such as Iraq, Libya, are particularly worsened by, by constant militarization of fragmented ethnic groups. No consistent solution to help these countries. In Afghanistan, conflict has raged on and off since the Soviet invasion in 79, 
uh, US-Afghan war on is now the longest ever and part of open ended uh, global war on terror, which was launched uh, after 2001 Al Qaeda. The Security Council resolution from March this year welcomed the progress toward the political settlement of the war. Afghanistan facilitated. Um, in Afghanistan, facilitated by the February agreement for bringing peace to Afghanistan and the US and Taliban, and the joint declaration for bringing peace to Afghanistan issued by the US and the Afghan government, which brought a little light into this region. Moving to the African countries, conflict is in Democratic Republic of Congo, the region of Sahel, Somalia, Sudan, all fueled by the fact that millions of people in Africa lack fulfilling work or meaningful stake in their country's future. Cameroon, Chad, Niger, Nigeria suffering from the ongoing security crisis, humanitarian emergency and development deficit resulting from the violence which is caused by the terrorist groups Boko Haram or the Islamic State. The lack of centralized and stable government or security apparatus and the surge of corruption in all these countries are some of the driving political factors of the conflict, consequently causing the forced migration economically benefiting an ideology-driven international involvement and the lack of mechanism to manage movement of people amplified the current unceasing situation to a large extent. Notwithstanding the active war conflict or the one in its ceasefiring or peacemaking phase, uh, the region of Middle East and Africa is even having an increasing tensions in international relations. For instance, the Iranian nuclear program that constant, constantly maintains nervousness worldwide. Um, that's about the uh, one determinant causing the post migration. I would talk now about the second huge group of the causes that, that um, leads to forced migration. And um, I call them like determinant, second determinant for the, for the Mm, prospective massive displacement in, of people in 2020 and also the future and also in a near history are the environmental factor. Africa has been identified and the region of Africa and Middle East has been identified as a hotspot for future temperature, temperature changes due to its dry environmental conditions. The issue of climate change as a security risk has lately been given increasing attention. At the end of March 2017, the Security Council Resolution 2309 of the conflict in Lake Chad region, which explicitly identifies the climate change as a contributing factor to stability, which was a unique step for the Security Council. The resolution says the climate change effects are mediated through what is currently drawn, desertification, land degradation, and food insecurity, and emphasizes the need for risk assessment and management to take these factors into consideration. The climate change increases the risk of conflict, poverty and hunger, undermine human rights, and is a still growing cause of forced migration. Same could be seen in Syria. Same could be seen in Syria um, uh, from 2006 to 2011. Um, it's a recent example of, of huge draw, dryness. Um, that was catastrophic and caused many families to, to move, to displace, to lose their farms and move to the big city. The draw also increased food prices, facilitating poverty. Although global warming did not cause or create the conflict we are witnessing today in Syria, environmental factors have supported the internal migration and the conflict environment before the war. Not trying to simplify the things that happened to Syria, but this case shows the example of climate change creating the breeding grounds for conflict and consequently massively contributing to human migration. In contrast to refugee movements driven by the conflict of persecution, no international convention applies specifically to the situation of those who are displaced by natural disasters or the slow onset effect of climate change. There is a Nansen initiative, uh, which was uh, joined by some more than 100 states, co-chaired by the Swiss and Norwegian governments, that presented an agenda for protection of cross-border displacement persons in the context of this climate change. Um, but um, a complex um, general document. Uh,
The last two groups of determinants that facilitate the migration could be derivated in this context from the first two social factors motivating migration growth from the human needs and desires to achieve a better quality of life. Migrants often move to ensure a better opportunity for themselves, their family, seeking the better education for their children, the better work condition, benefits, career growth, a better health care and social system as well. Some authors call this type of migration the social one that's based on the objective, the opportunity. I will mention here the last perspective, the economic migrant. This type of migration has been a large argument in the hands of Eastern and Central European leaders, leaders lately, uh, trying to confuse the public and on the refugee status and establish a culture of fear. Economic migration, whether permanent or seasonal, is a commonly cited reason for migration. In general, it is believed that in economic migration, people move from poor developing areas to the rich ones. The economic and social type of migration could be seen derivative in the context of the um, lately uh, European migration practice. In order to specify the tools or events called for the end of the migration crisis, we need to sort and categorize the main causes of mass migration since 2015. We have two main common denominators, the violent conflict and the environmental changes. A catalyst of what happened in 2015 and what could be repeated in the next future, near future. Now, moving to the potential measures, I would like to divide them also on two levels. Since migration is not strictly a national issue and there is not much space on this forum, I will shortly analyze the operation of the politically and legally competent bodies on the global level and the European one. On the global scale, one would immediately think of the United Nations, politically the most powerful international organization. Considering the conflict situation, the US Security Council could act under Chapter 17, the immediate threats to international peace and security. And it also did. The cases of Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya absolutely deserve the deep and separate analysis, but for this context, it is enough to say this region has not brought peace to the international community represented by the UN with an in, by the immensely powerful body, the Security Council, those resolutions had a direct effect and the applicability on the member states has not been able to deliver the systematic and coherent peace building measures. The United Nations faces its own challenges today, but without trying to undermine its great actions and efforts. These tasks, the continuous violent conflict in MENA countries and region in Africa, have not been managed well. Paradoxically, it became increasingly clear the reason could be the opposing interest in the region of the United Security Council's permanent members themselves. On 12th of May, so one month ago, uh, 2020, Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General of Iraq. Ms. Janine and Ms. Bashar, the head of the UN Assistant Missions for Iraq, delivered a speech in front of the United Nations Security Council, briefing the situation in Iraq. One of, of her points was, and I'm quoted, uh, I can only emphasize the way armed elements, armed entities, to differing ties to the states, chose to act, choose to act in this moment, will determine how Iraqis and indeed many others will perceive them. Once again, Iraq cannot afford to be used as a theater for different power competitions and conflicts. She also emphasized the political will to be fundamental in moving the structural changes in Iraq forward. Um, I can say uh, this could be applied to many other countries. The political will and compliance are the essence, are the essence of the changes. Considering the international legal tools, able, legal tools now, able to contribute to peace building uh, in MENA region in Africa, available international tool of law and justice, it is possible to analyze the operation or operations of international criminal court in this region. 19 out of 27 currently investigated cases are located in Africa. Um, the others also um, regarding Afghanistan, Libya and Iraq can be added. So together, it's 24 out of 27 cases that are um, investigating in this region. 
by the ICC. And the achievements um, after basically 18 years uh, of the ICC in ongoing conflicts were very clearly argued by the Russian representative in Security Council. It was in May 2014 when the Syrian case was um, uh, was uh, considered to be submitted before the ICC. And he said, I'm quoting, one cannot ignore the fact that the last time the Security Council referred a case to the ICC, the Libyan file by its resolution 1970, it did not help to resolve the crisis, but instead added fuel to the flames of conflict. And after the cessation of hostilities, the ICC did not rise to the occasion. The ICC does not contribute to return to normalcy or justice in Libya, evading the most burning issues. We are convinced that justice in Syria will eventually prevail. The old culpable of perpetrating grave crimes will be punished, but in order to have this happen, peace is needed first and foremost. The ICC has been designed to enter the territory of a state in ongoing conflicts or shortly after it and as a separate actor establishing justice. Question about what is what is integral part of the reconciliation process is uh, not new and um, it, is, it was not brought to the discussion by the ICC um, in uh, 61 1961 during the Cold War. German academic of Schneider wondered if justice could not attack back if it stimulated leaders of the next war to even fight more even intensely than surrendering and facing the possibility of being labeled as a war criminal. The establishment of the ICC was also initiated as a complementary tool of transitional justice. The concept of transitional justice is rooted in the ideology of legalism, considers the very concept of justice to be superior to politics, to be supra-political. This can be a very contraproductive basis for prosecuting war criminals, as it indicates the politics has no role to play in solving problems that are primarily political. The ICC is the archetype of ex ante tribunal, a court whose jurisdiction is established before the problem of security, um, of security is resolved, even before a solution is proposed. The media raise ongoing crimes that are going to be prosecuted and punished. The intervention of ICC in complex local conflict may not always have the effect expected in theory. The trivialization of the importance of local politics and the historical context of the security, but also cultural peculiarities of the nation may expose such initiative, initiative not only to pragmatic criticism, but also to the real threat of procedural paralyzing. Although well-intentioned by the ICC and the global civil society that helped create the ICC and the UN itself, it can recklessly prevent its own peace building and transition process within its own capabilities by snatching control out of affected communities and giving them to somebody culturally, socially, historically, and politically completely remote, which creates additional tensions, of course. The International Criminal Court is an integral part of peace building, uh, international peace building architecture, but surely it is not the tool contributing to diminish the displacement of people from the conflict zone. Um, after 18 years of his function, it can be argued that the establishment of criminal liability is not a substitute for leading to end of war, primarily an international instrument for justice, not a political instrument. Many discussion about the issue about the absence of peace without justice or the absence of justice without peace in this context, it seems um, the consensus on a political must precede the solution of the international law. Moving to European level, one can ask a question, well, uh, what instrument, political, the, the procedural one, um, political or one of legal nature uh, that really contributes to ceasefire on Middle East, in Africa and to help to diminish the mass migration. The European Union has reacted to the crisis of 2015 immediately according to its obligation on international refugee law. However, the onslaught of people trying to get to Europe has become so huge it needed to modify its migration policy and foremost asylum law. In the end of 2017, 
the Council agreed on a mandate to start negotiations with the European Parliament on the legislative draft proposal to, to reform the common asylum system. In September 2018, the Commission updated the single proposal regarding the EU asylum agency. Since then, all of the legislative proposals are under persistent consideration of the Council Parliament. In both cases, the primary sources and the press releases of this institution claim the negotiation are at the advanced stage. Though, following years of deadlock, or lately, lately uh, deadlock among uh, the EU states and very repulsive uh, attitude of the for countries, the European Commission is reportedly, reportedly withdraw its proposal to reform the disputed asylum regulation known as Dublin. But again, these are structural procedural changes, the reaction to the problem, the response to the problem that has arisen somewhere else. As I have mentioned in the beginning, we, we are not trying, I'm not trying here to look for the clusters on rounds, but um, there should be a way to look for potential ways to prevent the bounds from being even made. I have mentioned the UN Security Council, and very shortly argue this is disabled to cure the mass migration to Europe as its permanent members has demonstrated an enormous dichotomy between the economic and humanitarian interests in the region. International Criminal Court literally armed um, substantially with competencies to bring peace and justice disabled completely on one hand by the lack of support from the majority of P5 on one hand. On the other hand, it will function shows or votes late past that it is not too uh, because of the nature of effect it creates in the local communities. 2017, in July 2017, the Marshall Plan with Africa, uh, better known to the international public of the basis of the G20 Compact with Africa Plan, was presented under Germany's G20 presidency at the summit in Hamburg. It is a political initiative of um, BMZ, the Federal Ministry of Economic and, uh, and Economy, um, Economic Cooperation and Development um, of Germany to promote the development of the African continent and will primarily provide for promotion of uh, private investments. The plan is based on three pillars, quite deeply determining the specific processes, economic trade development, peace, security and stability, democracy, rule of law, and human rights. The Compact with Africa is an initiative aiming to boost private investments and increase infrastructure development in Africa, all in the spirit of the UN Sustainable Development Goals Agenda of 2030. Um, Africa's Poles population is set to double in 2015, and also African Union has themselves created an agenda to help. It's called Agenda 2063, uh, um, which is highly ambitious and the agenda of social economic transformation that we need to accomplish. Um, they, they say um, in a first goal um, that uh, Africa will be a prosperous continent with the means and resources to drive its own development and with a sustainable long-term responsibility for its own resources. The focus is on expanding economic cooperation mainly, as I said, through increasing the private investment. But what is the most important in this context um, is the plan related to business security, because maybe, you no, know, this plan is not the only one. There is plan of Austria, the island, uh, the kind of a joint uh, strategy from 2000. You know, um, but uh, this plan has something more than the others. And it uh, it's it's full of of uh, belonging to the business security. I would quote one um, civil society organization that said that uh, no one wants to invest in the area where the shots are being fired. Um, the same could be stated about Middle East, uh, Africa, Middle East, this region, agenda. 2063 and a compact with Africa both shall share the goal to fold down the weapons and set up very specific steps to achieve sustainable peace. Um, civil society does, uh, also 
also uh, claim we are advocating for a law on the arm control of arms exports that puts a ban on arms exports and the granting of licenses to reproduce weapons of war to non-NATO and non-EU countries. What is being advocated here is the measure number one to stop the forced migration to Europe, and it is to constitute a general ban on arms exports, including the granting of licenses outside the NATO countries and the EU member states. I was talking about the dichotomy of actions in security of Security Council permanent members was being praised for launching initiatives and supporting initiative very, very strong peacemaking and peace building agenda covered by the moral shield of the international organization like UN or NATO or OECD. But at the same time, not as a sovereign individual, separate states trading the arms to the very same conflict region. So maybe if we talk about the sequence of events called for the end of the migration crisis, this should represent the first step forward, stop exporting arms out of NATO and the EU countries. It has been three years since Germany launched the program for development in Africa in November 2019, Frau Angela Merkel hosted the high level conference in Berlin. Next event due to the pandemic has been moved to uh, our plans to October 2020. The compact with Africa has been actively supported by the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank Group, and many others, society organization and the Africa Economic and Business Oriented Organization. The framework provides a truly comprehensive solution based on three pillars, including the agenda of the climate change and necessary measures needed to be dealt with in the very same framework could be applied not only to region of Africa and uh, also to the region of, of the Middle East. Finally, Germany came up with a plan, but it is still uh, a plan supported by the different organizations and entities if the other countries would not step in. As I have mentioned in the beginning, we are not trying to look for the clusters on ground. We should be trying to look for potential ways to prevent the bans from being even made. The first and foremost policy of arm control and arm trade in EU and NATO countries must be changed. I have mentioned the UN Security Council and very shortly I could is disabled to cure the mass migration or help Europe to cure the mass migration as its permanent members are demonstrating and still demonstrating the dichotomy between their humanitarian interests and their economic interests. Um, in the Again, and the International Criminal Court, which could be able to help to diminish the conflict in the, in the region, but um, is lacking the support. Again, uh, as I have started to write the analysis, I, I, I definitely thought that there cannot be a national solution to the migration crisis, uh, but uh, I have researched more plans that has been launched and um this germany plan could be a way forward but they cannot do it alone i mean the european security architecture needs a pillar or needs a pillar of prevention of the conflict challenges are great and the climate crisis is a known and uncontrollable factor it would not help to diminish the displacement of people in the future obviously people will look always to Europe as a safe place and hopefully it always will be one. However, the Europeans should think progressively security threats the Europe is challenged with are not already the ones of the Cold War era and uncontrolled mass migration imposing one of these threats today. Maybe not from the point of view the EU cannot handle the people that are coming from Africa and the Middle East, but because and also because of the fear and the rhetoric of fear that brings the power to those who really a security threat are. The European security architecture in 2020 could, according to the telling visit basis in 2020, be built on new pillars. One of these pillars could be the prevention, prevention inspired by this German March Plan for Africa. So thank you very much for listening to me. And, um, Thank you, thank you very much for this uh, 
really wide uh, wide presentation and um, in my opinion very stimulating presentation i think that there will be uh, many uh, many curiosities and observations and questions at, uh, at the end when we have our discussion really um, a, a wide presentation in the global really in the global context in order to see to explore the possible reasons for this migration crisis and possible solutions as well. So, um, the next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Daniele uh, Ferrari, associate uh, researcher in the group Société Religion Laicité at the Ecole Pratique des Études in Paris and uh, associate researcher in the Unité Mix de Recherche du Région Entreprise Société in the University of Strasbourg. The, um, the title of this uh, presentation is uh, uh, Migrants and Religious Freedom. Please, uh, the floor is yours, Daniele. Thank you, Professor Piergigli, for having me. Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, my paper aims to investigate the relation between religious freedom and migration. And um, I want to develop this, this overlap, this cross uh, through two different trajectories. The first one is the legal trajectories in a legal and uh, international uh, legal sources. And the second dimension is about the phenomenological intersection between religious elements and uh, migration. Starting from the first uh, perspective, the link between freedom of religion or belief and migration emerged in the dynamic of development of human rights after the Second World War in two different perspectives concerning at the same time the different notion of freedom of thought, conscience and religion and religious minority. Starting to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, the concept of humanity becomes the condition to enjoy human rights and encompasses the historical model of religion as an element of national identity. In fact, if in European genesis of freedom of religion form is developed by the overlap between religion, sovereignty and nationality, from the principle of cuius regio eius religion in 16th century to the category of religious minority after the, 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 the First World War. In the new framework of freedom of conscience and the religion, religion is not protected thanks to the relationship between the person and the given state, but in the light of the belonging on, of, of humanity. In fact, uh, if in the traditional idea of religion, religion with ethnicity and, and language is an element to qualify the national identity, and in this traditional model, there is also the idea of the overlap between religion and territory and borders. Territory is the territory of the, of the nation. In the new framework of human rights, human rights is a global dimension, is a, a dynamic of democratization of religion in the light of freedom of religion or belief. Every person has the right of this freedom and the condition to enjoy of human rights and to enjoy of freedom of religion or belief isn't citizenship or nationality, but it's this uh, element of uh, uh, relationship with human being. And it's clear that in this dynamic is really, really general and important dynamic of, democratiza of democratization of human rights. There is also a useful protection for, uh, for migrants. But in the Universal Declaration of, of uh, Human Rights, there isn't the notion of migrants. In fact, Article 18 recognizes the freedom of thought, conscience, and religion to everyone. And the Article 2 clarifies that territory isn't a useful criterion to, uh, to decide the sites of protection of, of, uh, of fundamental rights. Moving to the Universal Declaration, the grow interest in cross between migrants and FORB in the international and European arenas is due to several inter interconnected factors, including the definition of religion, the codification of the specific legal sources and documents, the implementation of non-discrimination based on religion, the interpretation and application of religious refugee status, and the use of specific linguistic expression. Starting from the definition of religion, 
the mondialization of form produce a new inclusive definition of religion in international and European institution. The freedom of religion, it's a, a useful protection also for atheists, agnostics and indifferentists. And uh, it's, it's an important element because uh, the driving factor to read uh, this new development of religion in the light of freedom of religion or belief is diversity. It's the end of the identity of the nation. It's the end of the idea of a specific legal status linked to the protection of freedom of religion. And it's a really strong affirmation of diversity as a key factor to read this new dynamic. And the new meaning of religion is reflected in the application of, religion, of religious freedom in relation not only to the form of exercise of this freedom, but also in the concept of religious confession. This notion is no longer limited, in fact, only to historical religion and can be extended to new groups. Migrants religious group can claim the same protection of freedom of religion or belief as traditional religious groups. Shift to the codification of specific legal sources and documents, uh, the, the concept of migrants is a really useful element to read a new process of evolution in the human rights framework. This process can be represented in the United Nations dynamic with a timeline that finds its start in 1985 with a declaration on the human rights of individuals who are not national of the country in which they live. In this uh, uh, declaration, it's an example of, of soft law, but it's interesting that in this declaration, there isn't yet the notion of migrants, but there is the protection of freedom of religion or belief. And the model to codify the protection of religion or belief for migrants is the same model that uh, we have observed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The Article 18 of Universal Declaration of Human Rights became the legal, the legal model of the development of this protection also in the migrants framework. And uh, in 1919, the International Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrants, Workers and Members of their, of their Families uh, mobilized the notion of migrants and declined the protection of the freedom of religion or belief through three different uh, trajectories. The first one is the traditional protection of freedom of religion or belief, the right to have and to manifest religion or belief. The second one, is uh, the guarantee to the coercion to adopt another religion or belief. And the last one, it's really important, the liberty of parents to educate children according to their own conviction. In 2011, the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief uh, of United Nations include migrants uh, in uh, migrants worker in uh, his uh, report and uh, he qualify migrants worker as a vulnerable groups the mobilization of this linguistic category is interesting in our perspective because in this idea of vulnerability there is the clash between the religious identity of migrants and uh, the religious identity on the, or the, the traditional perception of, very, of, of religion in a given state. And uh, this clash, uh, this uh, conflict, can produce a lot of limitation in the manifestation of religion by migrants, say the special rapporte rapporteur, without the, uh, the, the necessity linked to protect public safety, order, health, or moral, or the fundamental rights and freedom of others. And uh, it's also interesting that uh, in 2016, the General Assembly adopted the New York, the New York Declaration of, for Refugee and Migrants. And uh, in this declaration, for the probably for the, for the first time, but it's, it's also interesting that there is the notion of mobility because there is the category of migration, but at the same time, this idea of mobility, it's something different, I think. And with this idea of mobility, there is also another idea, the idea of global approach, a global solution as the only model to protect migrants' rights. At the end, the protection of migrants' rights and the protection of freedom of religion or belief isn't only a protection, but is also international agenda of collaboration, of synergy between the United Nations and European organization. But there is also another interesting element. In 2017, the special representative 
representative of migration and refugee uh, within Council of Europe, said that uh, refugee and migrants are right orders, including of a right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. And they say, they underline that the European Court of Human Rights underlined in, in, in its case law that this freedom is one of the foundation of a democratic society. The protection of form isn't only a protection useful for migrants, but it's a test to measure the level of democracy in a given state and to measure the level of pluralism in a given state. It's also interesting that in 2013, the, the, the Council of the European, European Union elaborated specific European Union guidelines on the promotion and protection of freedom of religion or belief. These guidelines create a new model to protect migrant rights. In fact, if usually the protection of, of, of form cons, for migrants coincide with the phenomenon of migration linking to mobility of people, the guideline pursue the goal to promote in external action the uh, protection of foreigners. And in this, this strategy shows an innovation in protection of poor, because the classical condition of mobility to qualify the notion of migrants is replaced by the collaboration between European Union and third countries. Migration without migration. And there is also another element in 2016 and 2018, the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union in her annual report on human rights said that synergy collaboration is a driving factor to protect the freedom of religion or belief of migrants. And in this sense, freedom of religion or belief, it's a really important element in the relation between United Nations and European Union. The same, the same model of synergy of collaboration collaboration emerged in 2018 in the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration and in the Global Comp Compact on Refugee. Concerning the implementation of the principle of non-discrimination, this principle is developed by international and European institutions in three different perspectives regarding the innovative notion of intersectional discrimination, the representation of religion of migrants as the origin of discrimination, the use of the concept of discrimination as a test for migrant religious community. Starting to the first element, migrants uh, uh, can show a different uh, uh, level of diversity, linguistic diversity, religious diversity, ethnic diversity, gender diversity, maybe sexual orientation diversity. And sometimes the genesis of discrimination find its origin not only in relation to religion, not only in relation to language, but in the overlap, in the intersection between different factors, different characteristics of migrants' identity. In this idea of intersectional discrimination, the intersectional discrimination has the capacity to take into account this uh, dynamic of uh, relation between different factors in the, gen in the genesis of non-discrimination. And in fact, as the European Union observed in an innovative study about minority rights, a Syrian living in Europe could be discriminated against on the basis of his or origin of nationality, Syrian, race, ethnicity or cultural origin, Arab language, Arabic language speaker, or religion, Muslim. Secondly, uh, there is another element, the perception. The perception of, of migrants in the religious dimension, it's another important element to understand the phenomenon of discrimination and also to translate in this phenomenon the legal principle of non-discrimination based on religion. Why? Because uh, in particular for the Muslim community after uh, the terrorist attacks, there is a, a social and political uh, dynamic of deformation of religious identity, of negati negativization, stereotypization of this identity. And uh, as uh, uh, the European Agency for Fundamental Rights observe this dynamic of uh, deformation in negative terms of specific religious identity of migrants can produce discrimination. The last perspective is different. 
principle of non-discrimination is useful to protect migrants' rights, but it's also useful to verify if uh, migrants' community respect the rights of each other. In this idea, the principle of non-discrimination non -discrimination is a test to verify, to measure the level of, of compatibility, the level of integration of uh, religious, uh, religious community in Europe. And for example, during an international conference organized by the uh, Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief in 2016, in the context of the United Nations, uh, a lot of speakers said that the principle of non-discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity, it's a useful criterion, the respect of this principle, to measure the level of integration of, of Muslim communities in Western countries. It's, it's another perspective. Concerning the interpretation and application of, re of a religious refugee status, this notion finds its genesis in the Geneva Convention after it became the criterion to uh, create uh, the, the, European, the common European system of asylum. But uh, in my understanding here, the most important element is the role played by religious elements. In fact, in the religious refugee status, religious element isn't only an element of the identity of migrants as in general, but is the origin of migration. When a religion uh, determines a risk of persecution for the person, the person, in a lot of cases, decides to leave his country of origin, and in the light of this risk of persecution, can claim the international protection. But uh, it's a really specific dynamic of protection of freedom of religion or belief because the only condition to obtain the protection of form is the persecution. And uh, in this uh, meaning, it's really important the role of the persecutor. The persecutor produces the risk of persecution and in the legal perspective, the condition to obtain the refugee status. And in fact, to obtain the religious refugee status, it isn't important that I'm persecuting in relation to my real religion. I can be Catholic, but in the perception of my persecutor, I'm Muslim and I have the right to, to, the, to the refugee status. The important is the, is the risk of persecution and the risk of persecution change completely the, the approach to the protection of, of religious freedom of refugee. Concerning the specific, the use of specific linguistic expression, the intersection of form and migration emerge also from the, um, the creation of neologism. In this presentation, I want uh, to, uh, I have two examples, uh, and this example coincides with Islamophobia and Afrophobia. Islamophobia is an expression increasingly used interna in international European acts, starting from terroristic attacks in US in 11 September 2001. And, uh, Islamophobia describes irrational hostility, fear or hatred of Islam, Muslim, and Islamic culture. Afrophobia is another neologism created by the working group of experts of people of Africa descent of the United Nations and uh, is, uh, is a, a category used to describe a phenomenon to dehumanize and deny the dignity of a large group of people defined by visible characteristic of different, in this case, their skin, color, imaginative, psychological or behavioral traits, and also by invisible one, in particular, their relation with Africa. In this dynamic of, stereotypiz of stereotypization, of negativization of African identity, religion is a really important element. In fact, as the working group uh, uh, underline, discrimination on the grounds of race, religion, and gender affected, for example, black Muslim women. Oh, mm, I shift to the second part uh, about religious minority. Uh, uh, the notion of religious minority is created uh, in the dynamic of the, of the United Nations 
1977, and at the beginning, uh, the right to protect for the member of religious minority uh, are reserved for citizen. The member of religious minority have to be citizen, and the citizenship is the condition to enjoy these rights. After this traditional interpretation of the Article 27 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and this interpretation is developed and, uh, and uh, is developed also by Francesco Caportorti, uh, this definition changed. For the first time in 1982, the UNESCO, after the, at the end of the World Conference on Cultural Policies, create the new notion of foreign minorities coming from migration. And this uh, suggestion is taken into account by the Special Rapporteur of Freedom of Religion or Belief, by the High Commissioner for Human Rights, by the High Commissioner for Refugee, and in a lot of different legal sources, I haven't the time to, to do some example, but there is this idea that uh, there is the possibility to um, underline the existence of new minorities coming from migration. And it's another dimension of consideration of our, of our topic. The, phenomenolo the phenomenological perspective, and it's the last part of my presentation. In the phenomenological uh, dimension, religions show a really um, play a really ambiguous uh, role. Why? Because re religion can be the cause of migration, but can be also the element to justify a theological model of welcoming. Uh, firstly, uh, a lot of different terroristic associations mobilize religious elements to justify violence against other religious minority, other religious group. And for example, in Africa, Boko Haram as a group of Salafi jihadist ideology is qualified by the United Nations as a, a terroristic association and a member of Al-Qaeda. Secondly, theology of welcoming, the Catholic Church develops a public speech to welcome and, pour and protect migrants in international and external dimension. For example, in internal dimension, the Pope Francis in 2019, during the World Day of Migrants and Refugees, said that the official position of Catholic Church concerning the phenomenon of migration is, uh, can be described through four verbs, welcome, protect, promote, and integrate. Uh, also, the Federation of Evangelical Churches in Italy elaborated a theological approach of welcoming and uh, published a manifest for the welcoming of migrants in 2018. And uh, this is another example of uh, a really uh, another manifestation of religious element in, uh, in, in migration frame. I conclude. In conclusion, the overlap between migration and form produce innovation in legal and phenomenological terms. Migrants claim uh, protection uh, to their religious freedom, and this claim of protection find a dynamic of meaning in the legal and phenomenological dimension. Religion can justify a theological approach for welcoming, but also a dynamic of persecution in the name of religion. For is a fundamental rights, but also an international agenda within the convergence and divergence between form and promotion and protection of migrant rights show the eternal, the eternal dialectic among identity and diversity. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your presentation. Really interesting. About the traditional churches, uh, uh, it comes to my mind uh, um, the Swiss Constitution of 2000 that uh, stipulates uh, uh, a prohibition to build minarets uh, uh, in, the, <laughs> in the Swiss uh, uh, territory. So thank you for your presentation. The, the, there will be time for the discussion at, uh, at the end. Uh, uh, really, uh, also your, your presentation real, uh, really stimulating uh, um, the, the question about intersectional discrimination, uh, the difference between mobility and uh, migration that, uh, in my opinion, two are different things. Mobility is more uh, is, is a wider term, hmm? is a wider phenomenon, and the the, the neologies and all Islamophobia and Afro, uh, Afrophobia, no, uh, are, are also are uh, interesting issues uh, to. Um, 
to be deeper uh, in the in the discussion. So uh, we are on time. I I ask um, Marco Ventura uh, if uh, probably we can take uh, thirty minutes for back. Um, I would say. Um... Until yes. 11, 11, 15. Yeah, well, let, let's make 11, right? <laughs> okay. 11. We, 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 we sure we don't run out, uh, run okay. out of time after that. So let, let's keep it 15 minutes then. Huh? Okay. So at, at 11, uh, we, we start again. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria.